So welcome everybody. My name's Jo and this is Richard. Welcome to our virtual conversation on the subject of the new abnormal. This is going to be about a 15 or so minute conversation and the title is Help, How Do I Deal with the New Abnormal? What we're planning to do today is look at the pandemic from a society and mental health perspective and have a think about how our emotional resilience can help us cope during this time. So I'm just briefly going to introduce myself. Uh, I was a civil servant for over 20 years. I then became a consultant. I'm a non-executive director of a government organization, the health organization. And I also teach uh, resilience and stress management to civil servants and within the private sector. Richard. Yeah. Um, well, like, like Joe, I was, I was a civil servant, but I came in as a civil service psychologist for, for many years. And then I moved over to become a policy civil servant. And I've worked uh, subsequently on career coaching and personal effectiveness for Dodds. Uh, in a facilitation role, but in parallel to that, I have also retrained and come back to my psychology, if you like, and I now work in the NHS part-time in mental health, and hence the interest in this particular subject. What I thought we would do, Richard, is start off with a couple of personal reflections. Um, I was thinking that you could give us an example of something that you found difficult over the last couple of months and also uh, a sort of silver lining. Yes, well, I mean, I think that I, uh, the idea of being locked down at home didn't fill me with any particular anxiety, I thought, because I work from home a lot of the time. However, it was very different, very different circumstances. You know, there wasn't the anticipation of going into the office or whatever the next day. Uh, and the move to a virtual world was really quite disorientating uh, in a rather sort of subtle kind of way. Quite apart from the technology challenges, it was the sense in which it was my only communication with the outside world added to the fact that there were lots of reasons why I couldn't leave the house. That was difficult. The silver lining was realising, ironically, that a virtual world can be much more human than, than you think. I uh, found that... Uh, once I got on top of the technology, I rather liked the idea. It brought new dimensions to it and new possibilities, which I'm just, of course, still exploring. Mm. Well, we wouldn't have had this conversation exactly. without this virtual technology. For me, I think one of the difficult things has been the, the, the dissonance, the sort of paradox of being at home and it's beautiful weather and we're lucky enough to have a garden. We live quite close to Epping Forest. And yet the sort of horror of what's going on in the world and is it safe to go to a supermarket, is it safe to go to our local shopping street, having to cross the road if there's lots of people on the pavement. And I think it's that, that sort of difference in, in existence that I found quite hard. I think the silver lining for me, the most obvious one, is that we do have a garden. Um, the weather has been amazing um, and not having to commute, I mean, has been a joy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So the first thing that I'm going to ask you is this is uh, an extraordinary situation for the world to have to deal with. We haven't had a worldwide pandemic of this time for around 100 years. What, what do you think about our ability as humans to withstand this kind of stress? Well, I think humans are very resilient and, uh, and we've been built for change for, for much of human history. A lot of it challenges to survival, wars, pestilence and so on. And in our cushioned 20th century world, perhaps we've become a little bit used to being looked after in different ways. So this is a profound shock. Uh, but of course, everyone I'm sure out there is well aware of the, the usual things of fight, flight, freeze as potential responses to change. And we all have those physiologically built into us, literally. Um, and, uh, and the idea that 
of trauma which lists and stays with us and I think this is exactly the situation we're in right now a lot of it will be buried and some of us will hide it anyway but inside us and won't want to own up to it um, and the sense that also it's not doesn't follow a predictable timeline pattern. You know, we're used to the idea that uh, grief takes a long time to work through, some much longer than others, and that will be the same. Some people will get stuck with this and they won't be able to readjust back and others will thrive on it. So we have a sort of innate capacity to deal with stress and to deal with trauma and to deal with change. But is there also, are there also individual differences within that? Oh, very, mu very much so. Uh, some people, I mean, one of the things I didn't mention in my fight, flight, freeze was, of course, there is a fourth element, which is res creative resilience. Many people, we know this from, you know, concentration camps in the Second World War, how people survived in extraordinary kind of odds. And some people, you know, came through, which you wouldn't have expected them to do so. Some people who perhaps uh, thrive in steady state circumstances really struggle and I can remember that in my time in the civil service when we had an emergency sometimes the, the stars waned and new stars came to the fore. <laughs> That's interesting because one of the things that I've been thinking about is how this new reality um, is going to put a long-term pressure on people and one of the things that I think is going to be really difficult is that we're all going to have to make our own <clears throat> daily assessment about health and safety. Do I want to get on that train? Do I want to go to that shop? Do I want to travel when travel is possible overseas? And that's not something that, that the government can completely legislate for or control. Lots of this is going to be down to the individual and day by day decision making. And I think for some people who find that level of decision making quite tricky, I think that's going to have an enormous mm. effect. No. Yeah. Uh, and do you, but that rather sounds as though some kind of really quite conscious process of reevaluation is going to go on, that people are going to have to stand back and say, what's going on here and what do I care about? Do you think it's as fundamentally challenging as that? I think that's potentially one of the one of the upsides. I mean, I think the downside is that there is going to be enormous pressure around these everyday decisions. Um, you could argue that the upside of that is that it it is already making people sort of reevaluate what they want to do with their lives, where they want to live, if they're lucky enough to have a job, is that the job that they want to do uh, for the five or ten years? So I do hear people that I work with already reassessing um, that because this virus has made them stop uh, and think. And of course, if you're working on the front line and in a hospital, you don't have a lot of time to stop and think. So in some ways, this is a luxury problem. But I do think for some people, it will be a moment of change where they, where they want to do something different with the rest of their lives. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, I've been thinking about the, the mental health aspects, which is a very important part of this whole process. Um, and I've tend to think of it in sort of three distinct kind of phases, if you like. I'm not sure the phases is the right word. But first of all, there is the immediacy, the one you're talking about. You know, can I walk down to the supermarket? Would I get stopped by the police for, for, for taking and, you know, not paying the rules? And a lot of coping strategies, thinking within the day in the immediacy. And many people have had to, you know, perhaps get used to the idea of, of any kind of uh, planning beyond today it doesn't happen. But then there's the sort of second phase of, of this wears people down. And I think that's what we've seen in the media. A lot of people talking about the mental health legacy of this, where people have got worn down by it, exhausted. And that's the sort of breeding ground for anxiety, depression, or even possibly for some a sort of post-traumatic response. Mm, the, uh, yeah. the spike of that, as well as perhaps the uh, coronavirus. Um, uh, and I think that could be really very difficult for the country to handle but then there's the third aspect which is you know longer term and it might well be 
you know, a year, 18 months and beyond, will people find some real benefit from this? I mean, I, I do believe that, uh, uh, you know, the self-reliance and the creativity, the connectedness of people reaching out to neighbours and supporting, that's been a really real positive. But when the exhaustion sets in, people will have to then think, how am I, who am I and what am I? Therapy has been very yeah. much a part of the scenery. People eventually go to therapists, but that is kind of trying to cure something that's already happened. Um, and I think we're going to see a big upswing of that and a big burden on the NHS of that following this. I think there'll also be a sort of a shock factor when in a couple of months time people can stand back and think, you know, well, my relatives died without me being there. I think there's a huge amount of shock that's going to set in. Yeah, and, and I would agree that for some people that will be a major re-evaluation of what they care about in life. You know, that, uh, so for example, would I want to send my parents to a care home, for example, and, and leave them vulnerable? Will people think about decisions like that rather than being automatic? What, you know, what is my connectedness to the school and my children's education? Um, uh, how has my relationship at home been, uh, been bolstered or damaged by having to be cheap by jail for weeks on end, stuff like that? Um, but I think the upside of it is that um, there's a lot of learning in this that we know from pe people's crisis that people have that putting post-traumatic shock aside for a moment people learn new new strategies for living new sense of self-reliance of a sense of agency as as i call it and perhaps particularly that feeling bad um is not necessarily something to be eradicated so therapy is very mm. often about helping people to understand that bad experiences as opposed to um, disturbed experiences, which is another thing altogether, is really good for people. That's how they learn to cope. Not just being happy, that doesn't uh, provide that platform. That sounds like a sort of a, as you say, a kind of a phased approach though, because presumably we're in the not really understanding the full implications of this exactly and, and, and about to enter some of the sort of shock yeah, as well. that's right. And the, the thing, kind of thing I was just referring to is probably quite a long way down the line. I think one thing that people might get also from this is, I've called this negative capability. Uh, it's a term that I didn't invent. But the idea that we have to sometimes submit to our powerlessness, that's not something that modern society really mm. values a lot. In fact, it rather tends to frown on it. But yeah. many people I know, myself included, have found that sort of... Uh, I can't do anything, so I'll just give in to it. Strangely, is not a powers, powerlessness. It opens other kinds of possibilities. And I think that relates to your reevaluation of, of self and thinking about who I am. And so yeah, because as a society, we've been used to thinking that what we do defines us rather than, and yeah. now it's, it's a, it, to a certain extent, it's about not doing. Although there has been a bit of pressure on social media to sort of talk about how much exercise you're doing and how much you're reading and how much art you're doing. But for lots of people, I think this is just about getting through the day. Yes, and not getting stuck in the sense of, uh, you know, thinking about when, as we go into that second phase, OK, it doesn't have to be that negative. When we unlock, will I unlock to a better me in some sense? Yeah. And talking of, of sort of positive things, uh, what are the uh, so one or two of the things that well let me let me talk for myself first I thought we could share one or two of the things that we've done sure. personally to help us through the last sort of eight or so weeks I mean for me uh, uh, and I'm used to having to work at home and the way that I sort of navigate working at home is is that I have to have a structure um, otherwise discipline just goes out of the window so at the moment I'm setting an alarm for the same time um, I'm having a shower I'm getting dressed I'm setting an agenda for the day of things that I need to achieve um, obviously I'm trying to plan other things around it you know nice mm -hmm. food exercise etc but I really do need to structure the day otherwise I wouldn't be able to get through my work um, 
and the other thing that I found is helpful, and I, this isn't this is quite a popular thing to do, but is to write down the things that have gone well. Some people call that a gratitude diary, um, and also the things that I'm looking forward to. Um, and as our worlds have got smaller, <laughs> my list of things that I'm looking forward to doesn't include getting on a plane and going somewhere else, but it does include I'm going to have a gin and tonic at six o'clock, or I'm going to watch a really good film, or I'm looking forward to the weekend, sure. or I'm looking forward to being outside with the sun. So just concretizing that reality that you do actually have something to look forward to and having some control over your life, personally, I find helpful. I think I could, I could echo that too, because uh, my world is, you know, the shrinking of your world may seem limiting, but actually it's opened up all sorts of other things. So for example, uh, uh, the connectedness that we find in with neighbours and other people who need help and in family, I found that I'm much more and have connected at a deeper level. I'm really listening to people. I'm trying to understand their world, their predicaments and seeing whether I've got something to offer. Um, and, you know, not living in a bubble, I think, has been really, really helpful. And I think the second thing is uh, I've had to turn to other things that... Uh, you know, the time that I've had available from time to time, you know, of uh, uh, getting back to music uh, uh, and thinking about cooking, you know, doing things that are really quite um, uh, day to day, but really are opening up things. And just one illustration of that, I've almost eradicated plastic from my house in, in this time. I mean, not entirely, but I've taken some of those sort of things which seem to be un nothing to do with coronavirus very much more seriously. Okay. And, you know, there's such a boon in doing that. And I think a lot of people mm. can start to think about what could they take seriously in their life that they can control because they can't control the big things. Mm. I think that brings us to the end of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Um, I've enjoyed I, it. <laughs> the, the thing that I'd like to end on is um, kind of sending our goodwill out there, really. But, you know, some people are having an enormously tough time. Um, most of us have a lot of uncertainty over the sort of medium to long term because we don't know how this is going to play out um, health wise or economically. So I think we should send our best good wishes out there to everybody. I, I agree. And in so doing, I want people to, to try to not to hang on to their vulnerability and bury it like we've done, so many of us do. You know, allow yourself to talk about how difficult this, this is, because that can only help many of us. Okay, and on that note, goodbye Richard, and goodbye everybody.